Hi everyone. Ariel was a clipper ship famous for making fast voyages between China and England in the late 1860s. She is most famous for almost winning the Great Tea Race of 1866, an unofficial race between Fuzhou, China and London with the first tea crop of the 1866 season. Ariel was a full-rigged ship of 853 tons net register, measuring 197.4 feet to 33.9 feet to 21 feet. She was built in 1865 by Robert Steele and Company, Greenock for sure, Lowther and Maxton of London. Like the majority of tea clippers launched after 1864, she was composite built, of timber planking over iron frames. In the middle third of the 19th century, the clippers which carried cargoes of tea from China to Britain would compete in informal races to be first ship to dock in London with the new crop of each season. The Great Tea Race of 1866 was keenly followed in the press, with an extremely close finish. To Epping docked 28 minutes before Ariel, after a passage of more than 14,000 miles. Ariel had been ahead when the ships were taken in tow by steam tugs off Deal. But after waiting for the tide at Gravesend the deciding factor was the height of tide at which one could enter the different docks used by each ship. The third finisher, Serica, docked an hour and fifteen minutes after Ariel. These three ships had left China on the same tide and arrived at London 99 days later to dock on the same tide. The next to arrive, 28 hours later, was Fiery Cross, followed, the next day, by Taitsing. Given the close finish, and fearing that the consignees might find reason to avoid payment, the prize, or premium, was claimed by Tuepping but shared between them and Ariel, by agreement of their agents and owners. 1866 was the last time that a premium was written into the bill of lading of a tea clipper for docking in London with the first of the new crop. Though clippers raced with cargoes of tea for a few more years, the only commercial advantage was in the reputation as a fast ship, thereby securing a better rate of freight in the future. Whilst the outcome thrilled its followers, it was clear to some that the days of the tea clipper were numbered. The auxiliary steamer Earl King had sailed from Fujio eight days after Ariel, carrying both passengers and a cargo of tea. She arrived in London fifteen days before the sailing ships. The SS Agamemnon, a much more fuel-efficient ship than her contemporaries, had just made the fastest ever outward passage to China of 65 days and was on her way to London with a cargo of tea that was two or three times larger than a clipper could carry. The Suez Canal was under construction, and opened in 1869. This would give a much shorter route, a reduction of about 3,250 nautical miles or nearly a quarter less distance, so favoring the steamships, as the canal was not a practical option for sailing vessels. Tea was introduced from China to Europe in the 17th century, but, as a luxury item, was not transported in significant quantities until the 19th century. China was the main center of production until late in the 19th century. The British East India Company's monopoly of the tea trade from China to Britain ceased in 1834. This opening to competition meant that faster ships were needed, as merchants vied to be first in the market with each new crop of tea. Unlike the slower East India men that had carried tea during that company's monopoly, the tea clippers were designed for speed. Those that had achieved particularly fast passages could usually command a higher freight, the price paid to transport the cargo, than others. Tea wholesalers would mention in advertisements which ship had carried the different batches being sold. It was often the case that tea that was loaded early in China was of somewhat poorer quality than that which became available a few weeks later in the season. Yet this was what was carried by the first ships home and sold to the public with the cachet of a fast passage. The first cargo of tea landed could be very profitable for tea merchants, so they introduced incentives. In 1854, Vision had a premium of an extra £1 per tonne included in her bill of lading, payable if she was the first to dock. In 1855 Maury and Lord of the Isles raced for a premium of £1 per tonne with the latter the winner through getting a better tug to get upriver. Note that the premium did not simply reward the fastest passage, since rapid loading of a cargo and a prompt departure were important factors. In 1861, 
the consignees offered a premium of tens per ton to the first ship to dock in London. This was won by the Fiery Cross, who also went on to win in 1862, 1863 and 1865. At this time, anyone with a particular interest in shipping or business could easily follow the performance of tea clippers through the shipping intelligence column of their newspaper, and trade in tea was discussed in the commodities section of the business column. The news sections of newspapers started to comment on the first ship to dock from 1857. By 1866, newspaper interest was at its height, with speculation, updates and detailed reports. Many bets were placed on the outcome of the race, in London, Hong Kong, and the ports of Britain, and by the captains and crews of the vessels involved. The tea trade from China was a large undertaking. McGregor lists 57 ships sailing in the 1866-67 tea season, with a clear caveat that not every ship is listed, only the ones that he had researched. Over the season, these sailed from several ports, Fuzhou, Hankou, Shanghai, Wusung, Canton, and Hong Kong. Most departure dates stretch from the end of May 1866 through to February 1867. In May 1866, 16 of the best clippers had assembled at the Pagoda Anchorage on the Min River, downriver from Fuzhou. The quickest ships, as judged by the agents based in China, would be loaded first. However, it was not always the fastest that sailed first, much depended on the tonnage of the vessel and the standing and influence of the local agent. The race was not only a test of sailing, but also of efficient management at the port of departure. Each ship needed to be ready to receive her cargo. The hold was prepared by spreading a layer of clean shingle across the bottom to act as ballast. This was additional to the iron ballast carried by these extreme clippers. Between 150 and 200 tons of shingle was needed, and it was leveled to follow the curve of the deck above, at a distance precisely measured to be an exact number of tea chests. The tea arrived in lighters called chop boats, taking their name from the identifying marks on each batch of tea they carried. Lower value chests were loaded first as a layer across the ballast, with some shingle being packed between the chests and side of the hold. Then the main cargo was loaded in further layers, being carefully packed in with dunnage by the excellent Chinese stevedores. Despite the care taken, loading could be done quickly. In the 1850s, a ship loaded 8,000 chests of tea and 1,141 bales of silk in 17 hours work spread over two days. On the 24th of May, the first lighters arrived with tea, packed in chests, ready for loading. On aerial, the first layer of 391 chests and 200 half chests were loaded. By the 27th of May, she had 16 lighters alongside, with the Chinese stevedores working round the clock to stow the main part of the cargo. At 2 p.m. on the 28th, the job was done, giving a total of 1,230,900 pounds of tea. Aerial was first to complete loading. At 5 p.m., she and moored and moved down river to anchor for the night, ready for an early start. The same task was underway on other ships in the anchorage. Fiery Cross was next to finish, some 12 hours later, loading 854,236 pounds her master, Captain Robinson, in his haste to sail, neglected to complete his paperwork or sign his bills of lading, to the fury of Captain Innes of Serica. To Epping and Serica were able to get away together, having loaded 1,108,700 pounds and 954,236 pounds respectively. Tate Singh, with 1,093,130 pounds, was a day behind. Ariel started to raise her anchor at 5 a.m. on the 29th and with the paddle steamer Island Queen towing alongside, headed down river for the sea. The river pilot left and the tug was sent ahead to tow. The fast-flowing river min then presented problems for the underpowered tug as they met eddies and Ariel had to anchor to regain control of the situation. By this time it was low tide. With a mean draft of 18 feet 5.5 inches, there was not enough water for her to get over the bar. Captain K's frustration was increased by Fiery Cross, 
with a more powerful tug and drawing significantly less, towing past her and getting out to sea. Then the weather closed in, poor visibility preventing safe departure on the next tide. On the morning of the 30th, Ariel finally got to sea, but with to Epping and Serik only a few minutes behind and fiery cross 14 hours ahead. Three of the front runners now had as level a start in the race as a spectator could hope for. There was a moderate northeast wind and the course set was south by east to half east. All three had set their main sky sails and four topmast and lower stunt sails. Ariel was slowly overhauling the other two ships, but then the weather closed in and they lost sight of each other, racing on unseen in the rain. News reports of the start appeared in British newspapers from 11 June, when the Paul Mall Gazette carried a list of the first four starters, and names of the rest of the ships waiting to sail. The only additional information was that the betting at Hong Kong runs very high. From the timing of publication, one must presume that this news was delivered using the overland telegraph route from Gala in Sri Lanka. The sailing route from the China Tea Ports to London is across the China Sea, then the Indian Ocean, passing Mauritius, rounding the southern tip of Africa into the Atlantic, generally passing to the west of the Azores before turning towards the English Channel. The major variations were in the China Sea, with different strategies to pick up favorable winds. A direct route to the Indian Ocean is through the Sunda Strait. Circumstances or a cautious captain may dictate use of the Eastern Passage. This meant heading out into the Pacific Ocean, going down the eastern coast of Formosa, Taiwan, and the Philippines, then through the Gililo Strait, Pit Passage, and the Ombai Strait into the Indian Ocean. The distance from Fuzhou to London is described as being over 14,000 miles by McGregor. Ariel logged about 15,800 nautical miles from China to London on her 1866 passage. The crossing of the China Sea frequently decided the overall passage time to London. It also had notable hazards, particularly as accurate, fully surveyed charts did not exist at this time. The five ships leading the 1866 race all headed for the Sunda Strait, sailing past the Paracels, down the coast of Annam and then south to Borneo, bound for Rania, on the southern side of the Sunda Strait. Adjustments were needed later in the voyage as stores and water were used. The loaded draft of 18 feet 8 inches forward and 18 feet 3 inches aft was eventually altered to 18 feet 1 inch forward and 18 feet 3 inches aft by moving some of the cargo into the after cabin, and generally moving aft any heavy movable material. This improved the steering and general sailing performance. Adjusting the trim went on against the continual background of sail trimming setting and taking in sails, maintenance work and repairs. In the early part of the race, Ariel sighted to Epping on the 2nd of June, whilst following the coast of Annam, modern Vietnam, and again on the 9th and 10th, approaching the coast of Borneo, about 760 nautical miles to the south of the previous sighting. On the 10th to Epping, about 4 miles behind, signalled that they had passed Fiery Cross on the 8th. This put Ariel ahead. As the ships progressed across the Indian Ocean and around the southern tip of Africa, the race became closer, the lead shifting between the first three. Serica made up a lot of lost ground by the time they were passing St. Helena. The next sighting between any of the participants was on the 9th of August, when two Epping and Fiery Cross exchanged signals some 12 degrees north of the equator, in the Atlantic. Winds were light and variable so they remained in company until 27 August, when a breeze sprang up which carried to Epping out of sight in four or five hours, whilst Fiery Cross suffered the enormous misfortune to remain becalmed for another 24 hours. The distance between the five ships continued to reduce as they reached the Azores. Ariel, Fiery Cross, to Epping and Serica all passed Flores on the 29th of August. Taitsing was 48 hours behind them. The next waypoint was entry into the English Channel. Ariel sighted the Bishop Light at 1.30 a.m. on 5 September 1866. With all possible sail set, she sped toward the mouth of the English Channel. At daybreak, another ship was seen on the starboard quarter, also carrying every stitch of canvas that she could. A strong west-southwesterly wind carried these two ships up the channel at 14 knots. 
The Lizard was abeam at 8 a.m. and start point at noon. The two ships were off Portland towards 6 p.m. and St. Catherine's Point was due north at 7.25 p.m. At 3 a.m. on the 6th, Ariel was approaching Dungeness, so started signaling for a pilot. At 4 a.m. she hove to and continued to signal with flares and rockets. To Epping, also signaling for a pilot, was coming up fast and was close astern of Ariel at 5 a.m. There was no sign that to Epping would heave to, so Captain K ordered Ariel's sails to be filled to keep ahead of the other ship, to be sure of getting the first pilot. On to Epping, Captain McKinnon conceded and also hove to. At 5.55 a.m., the pilot arrived on board Ariel. He saluted Captain K with congratulations at being the first ship from China that season. He got the reply yes, and what is that to the westward? We have not room to boast yet. At 6 a.m., both ships were underway, heading for South Foreland. Despite to Epping resorting to setting some stun sails, Ariel was about a mile ahead. Then both ships signaled for a tug. Here luck was with to Epping, as the better tug put a tow line aboard her, so she took the lead as they were towed round the coastline of Kent and into the Thames. To Epping arrived at Gravesend some 55 minutes before Ariel, but that gave her no advantage as both ships then had to wait for the tide to rise sufficiently. Ariel then had the shorter distance to go, arriving outside East India Dock Gates at 9 p.m., but the tide was still too low for the gates to open. To Epping carried on upriver to London docks. Here, unlike the entrance to the East India Dock, there was an inner and outer set of gates. To Epping's shallower draft allowed her through the outer gates, then they topped up the lock from the dock basin. She passed through at 9.47 p.m. Ariel entered East India Dock at 10.15 p.m. While Ariel and to Epping were racing up the English coast of the Channel, Serica had been speeding along the French side. She passed through the Downs at noon and just managed, at 11.30 p.m., to get into the West India Dock before the lock gates were shut. This meant that these three ships had left China on the same tide, sailed over 14,000 miles in a race lasting 99 days, then all docked in London on the same tide, with less than two hours between them. Fiery Cross was not far behind the first three, she sighted the Isle of Wight at 10 a.m. on the 7th of September but, on arriving in the Downs, was compelled to anchor because the wind had now risen to gale force. She docked in London at 8 a.m. on the 8th of September. Tatesing arrived on the morning of the 9th of September. The owners and agents of Ariel and to Epping agreed that whichever ship docked first would claim and the other would not dispute the result in any way. In return, the two ships shared the premium between them, and also McKinnon and Kay shared the £100 prize for the winning ship's captain. This is what happened, to Epping made the claim and shared the money equally with Ariel. The premium payable to the first tea clipper to arrive in London was abandoned after the 1866 tea race. With the completion of the Suez Canal the tea trade was taken over by steamships and most of the clippers transferred to the Australian trade, carrying general cargo to either Sydney or Melbourne, and returning with wool, for which a premium price was also paid on the first shipments of the season. Ariel sailed from London for Sydney on 31 January 1872, but failed to arrive. She is assumed by most who knew her to have been fatally pooped. Her fine lines always made her at risk of this. Around August 1872 the remains of her teak-built ship's lifeboat carrying a brass fitting with the Gothic script letter A were found on King Island in Bass Strait. It was believed to have come from the missing vessel, which, if the assumption was correct, probably foundered in the Southern Ocean after rounding the Cape of Good Hope. Thanks for watching.